Welcome everybody to 52 Living Ideas. It's an honor indeed to have Mark Stallman back. Continuing, this is the fourth, fourth in the series of the lectures on Trivium University. These are the invitation lectures. What do we have today? Uh, Mark, go ahead. Uh, thank you and, and uh, indeed thank uh, all the uh, folks who have been uh, so generous with their time to show up. Uh, what we're doing here is uh, presenting material, which we uh, will then post on YouTube and, and use as uh, uh, an effort to provide details on the curriculum of an upcoming experimental online uh, school called Trivium University. Um, uh, Fred Beitler, who's on the uh, screen here, is uh, my co-founder. Uh, in this entire exercise. Uh, there are many other people on the screen here who uh, have already contributed and, and will be contributing. Um, so we have uh, a lot of the uh, moving parts in place. Uh, so stay tuned. Um, we have uh, also a great deal of work to do before we can uh, launch something. So, uh, and uh, people are, are also uh, generally quite busy. So. Um, we haven't yet set a date exactly for launching Trivium, but it will be uh, for certain uh, next year. That's a pretty wide margin. A lot of things are going to happen in 23, as we all know. Uh, first slide, please. Give me just a second. So um, to recapitulate very quickly here, um, this is the fourth in a series of invitation lectures. The first was a description of the causes of the crisis in which we are currently living. The answer to that question, of course, was that we're in a paradigm shift. The second invitation lecture was specifically on the topic of paradigms and trying to understand the differences between the paradigms that we have experienced in our own lifetimes, that we've experienced uh, through our understanding of history and uh, what we're now living through. The third, uh, uh, last week, of course, uh, was on the topic of uh, thinking anew, which is the uh, phrase that uh, Fred Beitler uh, gave for that particular lecture. All three of those topics, crisis, paradigm, methodologies for thinking about things, have libraries of other writers attached to them. So there's a great deal out there that you could look to. I think uh, we probably have contributed something meaningful in all three of those. And, and in particular, by bringing them together, we have a coherent narrative but what we're gonna to do today is completely striking out into new territory. You will not see this material anyplace else. That may mean that it is um, foolish. It may mean that it's brilliant or something else uh, along the way. <laughs> but um, I will note for you that the three spheres uh, theme is something that we have been working on now uh, for uh, many years. My screen just went blank. Shrika? And you are muted, Shrika. Give me just a second. I'm starting it again. Sure. Um, after uh, hundreds and hundreds of, of Zoom uh, calls, uh, Bill Frez's uh, approach, which is to uh, take advantage of the uh, screen that uh, can be put up behind you. And in case you were wondering, uh, Bill is now sitting in front of the Fall of Rome uh, and is also in, in possession of uh, some airplane tickets to take him in that general direction. 
Bill is a, a keen follower of, of Roman history in particular. What's behind me today are three spheres. And, and so, uh, how are we doing, Srikant? There, there we go. go. Good. So this is brand new material. And uh, once again, uh, the structure here will be four slides uh, to be followed uh, by uh, two jests of honor. Today, our jests of honor uh, uh, will be uh, John Alton and um, I believe uh, Aaron Lewis. Um, John will be talking about the uh, East sphere uh, briefly. Aaron will be talking about the digital sphere briefly. We've talked a lot about the West sphere. Globalism, of course, has been the organizing principle of geopolitics during all of our lives. It was born out of World War II. It had an enormous amount of um, support, particularly from America, because um, arguably its uh, architects um, were the Rockefeller family and, and those around them. If you get a chance to go to the Rockefeller estate, now a museum in Pocanico Hills uh, near Terrytown in Westchester, uh, the name of the estate is Kaikuit. And as you enter, you will see a, um, a fountain, name of which is Oceana. And so the idea that we are not limited to one ocean, but all the oceans are reporting in uh, to the same uh, headquarters uh, was the, the globalist uh, scheme. That is now finished. And uh, what we'll be doing in addition to these presentations and some other plans, we'll be adding some bibliographies. I've been uh, listing out names of things, but one of the things that will be on the bibliography for today's lecture will be a, a series of presentations, um, including New York Times uh, op-ed pages and so forth, where many people who had been promoting globalism have come to the, what for us is a relatively obvious conclusion, that globalism uh, or globalization, as they might put it, is now finished. We're heading into something quite different. They will not tell you that globalism was a product of the environment created by television, which was the end of the electric paradigm. So what we're living through now is a shift from television to digital. <clears throat> so by bringing together the paradigm theme, which is more fundamental, and the more superficial observation, that globalism doesn't seem to work anymore. Hopefully we've advanced the conversation. Digital technology ushers in a new paradigm with, with many different characteristics. And we could in fact, and probably will at some point do another series. Uh, what, it, what is it that sets digital apart? There will be one slide today that will at least uh, compare it on some matters, but I wanna emphasize here that what digital does is it separates. These are digits. By the way, this is not. Um, but um, our, uh, our toes, including the big toe, um, are all called digits. And the reason why digital technology got that name um, is because it separates. It is built upon largely a binary scale. Um, there ha have been and, and still are important advocates of analog computing, which was the alternative to digital as these schemes are coming together in the 40s and 50s. But this distinction between no longer trying to be universal, no longer trying to apply the same labels and categories to every one of the spheres is really the main point I'd like to get across today. We are now living in a world of particulars. If you recall when we were talking about the inner senses briefly, it turns out that that shifts from a consciousness to a subconsciousness and a recognition of the subconscious and analog, uh, analogical thinking uh, is an enormously uh, important distinction between where we have been and where we're going. 
So as a result, multiple civilizations are being retrieved. There was a massive effort over the course of the last uh, uh, particularly 50 years to try to uh, pretend that a pluralism, but all under the same guiding principles was sufficient. It was not. The distinctions between these various spheres as the next slides will point out cannot be syncretized. They are quite distinct one from another. And in addition, we're in, in a, uh, a formation period here where new civilizations are being generated. And in that regard, we have the digital sphere. One of the mentors to our efforts is Samuel Huntington. Sam Huntington uh, is a fascinating uh, figure, uh, probably much more important than people give him credit now. I recently attended a uh, conference. It was meant to be discussing uh, geopolitics. And uh, everyone in the room, of course, had read Sam Huntington, but it was as if he was under the rug somehow. And so it wasn't until I brought up Huntington in the conversation, which to some extent shifted the, the entire theme going forward. So you will remember perhaps Huntington's Clash of Civilizations. Um, that was not accepted by the globalists. It was uh, roundly rejected, but it is happening now. The clash component of this represents the danger. So one of the ways that we have described this uh, three sphere situation is to liken it to the uh, astrophysics problem of uh, three bodies, three body problem. And so you will also see when we get the bibliography up, the uh, Chinese science fiction uh, work uh, trilogy, um, Remembrance of uh, Earth Past, the first volume of which uh, by Shishin Lu uh, is entitled Three Body Problem. Synchronization across these civilizations becomes imperative. We've never been in a situation in which there are not two fighting for hegemony, which is the way most globalists think of these things and the way you will most commonly hear it described today, that there's a conflict to figure out who's going to run the world. That's not what's going on. Uh, but rather, um, in order to avoid catastrophes, uh, you will hear a great deal more from us and Trivu, in fact, will focus on the topic of synchronization across these civilizations, which has become imperative. Next slide, please. So you'll see in the next three slides, the same basic structure. It is our belief that technology begins at birth. We are born not just naked. Um, we don't really have a blank slate, of course. There's an enormous amount that has been built into us. And yet, uh, we must first learn how to speak, and then, crucially, to belong to a civilization as opposed to a culture. We have to learn how to write. And it is that writing technology which comes into our lives at a very early age, which has probably the single most important technological impact on shaping uh, our subconscious and ultimately the way that we see the world. The East sphere has been founded on logograms. Uh, once upon a time, we refer to these as ideograms, as if there were ideas embedded in them. That's uh, uh, probably a mistake. A much better term from the standpoint of uh, scholars, of uh, chirographics, that's to say uh, handwriting, uh, is to call them logograms. And but the logo here uh, signifies the fact that these are meaningful. Uh, the most obvious example of that, of course, is the Chinese character for a human, um, which is uh, two strokes um, resembling a, uh, 
human beings standing up on their legs. Meaningful scripts are not the basis of all these spheres. The East sphere has that as its heritage and they are applying that heritage in a very aggressive fashion now by retrieving their own classics, which to be read in the original script probably means that, that people will need to learn uh, a classical Chinese uh, which is not what they uh, learned in school. So there's an enormous amount of work going on now, particularly in China, but elsewhere, uh, to search for the Tao. And so the ultimate uh, goal, and maybe this is uh, to West sphere of me, to think in terms of final cause, as Aristotle put it. Um, and as, uh, as you will see in the, in the bullet point, down here, um, linear progress is not the hallmark of the East sphere, but the way, the Tao, as it is understood under digital conditions, uh, would be a, uh, an excellent series of books to help us better understand what is actually going on in China. If the West insists on seeing the East as just another version of itself, not only will they not understand, but more importantly, that will amplify the potential for conflict. In addition, in the way the East sphere, again, particularly uh, China, which has been a focus of the Center for the Study of Digital Life and will be a focus at TRIVU, which is a project of CSTL, uh, classical attitudes and ancient wisdom have taken on a very different character over the course of the past 10 years or so uh, in, in China and elsewhere in the East. Um, those who have followed Frikant's 52 Living Ideas know that he has spent hundreds of hours in uh, comparisons between the Tao uh, Te Ching, um, the Bhagavad Gita and uh, the Gospel according to St. John. And I, I think that it's fair to say that um, Sri Kant's approach and his uh, many people who've worked with him on this is not to try to syncretize them into one common uh, theme. They are not. The notion that all of these really are saying the same thing, but just in a different dialect is wrong. In fact, these are quite different from each other. The Tao uh, is very important for this conversation because um, uh, we believe that current uh, Chinese leadership uh, is particularly interested in Taoism, um, elevated above the traditional Confucianism. And one of the reasons for that, maybe not even the most important one, is that Taoism was the source of China's engineering and theoretical scientific uh, innovations. So we've all heard that the Chinese invented everything but didn't use it. Those inventions were done under periods of uh, Taoist uh, ascendancy. It is the Eastern view that humanity can harmonize with nature. <clears throat> that is often not the Western view, for instance. Manichaeanism, the notion that, that uh, nature is evil and that we have been tossed into uh, nature and must somehow escape uh, has a lot of uh, expressions. That is not the dominant East expression. Furthermore, the view that technology must, indeed can and must, conform to human goals is uh, very uh, strong in the East. And this is the difference that you will notice in the newspapers between the way that, for instance, the US and Chinese government uh, governments approach their technology companies. Um, furthermore, uh, in the East, the notion of linear pro progressive history, uh, ultimately, of course, um, leading in the, in the Christian West, uh, and its derivatives, um, and I hope I'm not going to offend anybody to say 
that the Islamic Quran is in many respects an eschatological, a end of the world, a map for what will happen uh, when it all comes to an end. That's a Western, not an Eastern approach. Rather, as I learned early on in, in my experiences uh, in the East, um, thanks to my uh, co-founder of CSTL, uh, who's uh, uh, Phil Midland, uh, we had a chance to delve into this. And, and in fact, the cyclicality, um, many uh, different cycles have been noted. Um, some of you may be familiar, for instance, with uh, uh, Kontratiev uh, as Lenin's uh, favorite economist. He was a cyclical economist. Um, many uh, in Chinese leadership today think in terms of 700 year uh, cycles. Um, and if you map 700 or so years onto Chinese history, you'll see various highs and lows, and you'll see that we're now climbing towards the next of those highs, which will then lead likely to a decline. Society being more important than the individual has been explained a hundred different ways, but I'm going to explain it in terms of the underlying technology and particularly the language and writing technology upon which the East has been founded. Next slide, please. The West fear is something, of course, that, that um, by and large, um, this audience has grown up with. Uh, there may very well be uh, some uh, who did not, but uh, as we know, uh, our writing technology is founded on the alphabet. And the alphabet is not meaningful symbols. These are phonetic symbols. In particular, the Phoenicians, uh, from which we uh, get uh, much of the original alphabets, left almost nothing for us to ponder. That is because phonetic scripts allow you to map them into any language. And the Phoenicians, of course, dominated the Mediterranean and beyond. In fact, I think I probably have some Phoenician heritage as a result of that through Ireland, which was uh, sort of the last stop on the Phoenicians' uh, journey. Um, phonetic scripts being not attached to meaning starts these two civilizations off in radically different, these two spheres rather, in radically different directions. India is an interesting in-between. Indian Sanskrit in particular, which Srikant um, has been building his competence in, confidence and competence, uh, is neither alphabetic nor logogramic, logographic. It is a somewhere in between. And so that uh, uh, geography of being in between uh, also translates into its uh, civilizational characteristics. The West sphere has largely been founded on humanist attitudes, sometimes separating the humans from everything else in terms of being made in the image of God, for instance. And the, these humanist attitudes have given us a progressive, and in particular, an end time orientation. So progress is pointing us uh, in a direction. And for the West, this represents searching for virtue. Searching for virtue is very different from searching for the Tao. So we have here already in the first couple of bullet points on the first of these two slides, some distinctions that are worthy of uh, seminars, worthy of uh, full-blown uh, university courses, rarely treated this way, but this is how we're going to approach things at Treview. Technology is viewed not as an adjunct to nature so much as it is for human self-perfection. And so this notion of perfection, which has some analogs in the East sphere, winds up being enormously important. Um, the Western saint and the Eastern saint are not the same. Um, and this distinction uh, is likely to become more and more clear. 
heaven and hell, which is to say the end time orientation, still structures potential outcomes as secular as we might think we are. The fact of the matter is that secularity is um, also uh, on, the, uh, on the block, so to speak. Um, digital as a new paradigm uh, has already in many instances and only at an accelerating pace will shift religion back into um, the center ring in the circus. The West sphere, of course, uh, and this has uh, hundreds of expressions and, and many libraries devoted to it, but this emphasis on the individual being more important than society is a serious distinction between East and West and needs to be brought into any kind of understanding of what's actually going on uh, on, on the geopolitical uh, frame. Next slide, please. So this is the fourth of the slides I'm talking about. I've been talking for about 25 minutes now, so hopefully I will uh, be able to end this relatively soon and we'll bring in our guests of honor. Um, the digital sphere is not based upon meaningful scripts. <clears throat> It's not based on phonetic scripts. It's based on algorithmic scripts founded on code. Now, I will just note for you briefly that my own career uh, began with a software company that I founded in the 1970s. And I was for a decade or so, a coder. I have more recently gone back and taught myself um, the uh, uh, today very common programming language Python, just to see if I could, could still do that. And it, it turned out to be not particularly difficult. My father was a historian of ancient mathematics. The uh, story was that he learned 17 um, extinct languages. So I set out to learn 17 extinct programming languages, which was kind of a fun exercise. And then of course, I promptly forgot all of what I had done, but it was uh, fun. The uh, attitudes in the digital sphere uh, are post-human in very significant respects. Um, there is uh, widespread throughout current academia, um, not just in the West, and this is important. These spheres all overlap. We can find expression of all three spheres anywhere on earth today. So this overlap is not quite the image that is behind my head here, but uh, those three spheres at least helps us understand some of the distinctions. And that post-human attitude is expressed probably most commonly in a orientation towards leaving planet earth. So in this regard, you will have a chance to consider whether such personalities as Elon Musk, Jeff Bezos, and others around the world who have focused on escaping uh, planet Earth and becoming a uh, multi-galaxy uh, species, as it's sometimes said. Yes, there's probably a lot of foolishness in that. But that's the superficial foolishness. There is underlying that a much more significant subconscious commitment to getting beyond humanity. In particular, what some would call humanity 1.0, largely because post-humanists have talked a great deal about humanity 2.0 or humanity plus. There's a variety of ways they describe this. But the Truth of the matter, as far as digital sphere is concerned, by and large, and, and here I, I should be clear, I'm expressing this in seven bullet points. I'm taking five minutes per slide. <laughs> the, these are topics that, that deserve many hours of careful examination. So, so please don't take anything that I'm saying here as being definitive or universal, because we're now in a situation where particulars matter more. And so one individual and another are likely to differ in significant respects. But if humanity 1.0 is not going to make this transition, 
then we're going to have to use technology to transcend our captivity. This is not the way either the East or the West sphere approach things, which is not to say that there aren't people in the East and the West who've also adopted this attitude. The way that uh, governments in the West and governments in the East, however, have dealt with those attitudes is as you might expect, quite different. Immortality has become a key objective. So people here are probably familiar with Ray Kurzweil um, and stories about him uh, eating handfuls of vitamins so that he could somehow survive uh, long enough in life that he, we would get to uh, quote the singularity. Uh, and so uh, this does get uh, science fiction-y and, and somewhat silly. Um, our emphasis again is on the human subconscious attitudes associated with these spheres, not whether any one particular plan is likely to be successive. We are, uh, we're in particular, we're rather doubtful about the program for artificial general intelligence. Um, AGI is getting an enormous amount of attention, enormous amount of investment, um, but uh, the net of this, just to finish up my part of this, is that there is an exuberance, there is a momentum, there is a uh, financial backing. And, uh, and so the digital sphere, perhaps more than either the East or the West sphere, being the newest of these civilizations, is very much on the march. Resistance is futile, of course, uh, is the Borg. Uh, and to infinity and beyond uh, is a uh, toy story. So these are, these are two memes coming out of the previous paradigm that might be applied to what's going on here with the digital sphere. So that is my part of the presentation today. Um, could we now draw upon my good friend, John Alton? Hi there. All right. Well, would, should you introduce me or shall I just go? I think the slide on the screen here uh, provides a okay. pretty good introduction. You can, uh, uh, okay. uh, John um, is the only one of the Jests of Honor who actually sent me a biography and it would have uh, taken multiple slides to show it, but I hope this uh, reflects uh, John Alton. Um, John is a, a close collaborator of many of our uh, efforts at, at the center. Um, like uh, myself, uh, he came to this uh, as a result of working with uh, Phil Midland. Um, we very much uh, respect and uh, enjoy John's contributions. So John, would you uh, just speak yes. briefly here on, on the topic yes. of, of uh, the East sphere and what we're trying to do with Trivium? Yes, um, so I was brought into this uh, by Phil Midland, as Mark pointed out. There's my, my uh, credentials are really in martial arts, where I practiced for many years. And over the time, I became interested in the background of these martial arts. So that kind of came later. And it's divided roughly into 20 years, I would say 15 years in the U.S., and then the rest of it has been Chinese oriented with a real emphasis on China, but I studied Japanese, Okina Okinawan, Korean martial arts while in the US. And then I was introduced to Chinese in the US around middle eighties. And then I went to China and got apprenticed over there and was completely changed by the experience and had pursued um, Qigong in particular um, since that time. That's how I met Phil Midland, published my first book. He read it. We got together, we made several efforts to try to work with China and to involve uh, the Department of Defense in the US and high level people um, in China, also businesses and hospitals and, and um, universities, and all of which ran smack into the, into the East is East and West is West and there the twain shall meet uh, cliche. Um, it was very difficult to get everybody on the same page. So as Mark points out, these differences matter. And um, where I'm coming in on this is I have my own company now that is working to develop products to help people control their health. And primarily through uh, 
physical practice and then through books and videos and and other technologies. Um, right now, we're looking at a chi machine, a machine that actually produces chi under the umbrella of a um, Western concept called torsion energy, uh, which you can Google anytime. If you go on Google, it'll come up as pseudoscience. So I encourage you to be selective about looking into torsion energy, T-O-R-S-I-O-N. And um, I think that's probably gonna be the future. And what I bring to this is that my belief now is that Qi is the next paradigm shift. We got digital, digital's been underway for 20 years. These paradigm shifts keep coming quicker and quicker and quicker. Um, qi plus digital, and digital is allowing the Chinese to understand Qi even better than they already understand it with 4,000 supposedly, at least 2,000 years of scribal um, knowledge that they've recorded. So I'm digging into that and trying to bring that to Trivu and to Mark and to his Center for the Study of Digital Life. And we're actively working in collaboration together. And I appreciate um, his help and support. And he's really, his ideas about the Western sphere and digital especially um, have been groundbreaking for me, really cracked open um, an understanding. So thank you very much. Uh, thanks, John. Um, uh, last slide, please. Aaron Lewis, un unfortunately, was not able to join us today. <laughs> so um, he's uh, not a jest of honor, but I will uh, talk a little bit about his background and you can uh, take a look at his work. Um, Aaron is a, uh, a digital designer and a, a prolific writer who is engaged in, in many very interesting uh, projects. So his website is probably a good place to go. Much of this uh, biography was actually taken from that uh, website. I didn't know that he had been a classical guitarist, for instance, uh, clearly retired. Uh, he's a young man, so he's seen a great deal. Um, cognitive psychology, uh, uh, we've had a chance to talk about at some length. And, and as uh, we've described here, um, what he studied in cognitive psychology and computer science were, were quite compatible at Yale, but it turns out that's last paradigm, as you would expect Yale to be. So we are working on moving into the new paradigm. Um, Aaron, uh, like many uh, folks of his age, uh, uh, blogs and, uh, and has a lot of, of, of important exchanges out there. So. What I had hoped uh, Aaron would talk about was his own experiences uh, in the digital sphere. Uh, one of those topics uh, would have been a discussion of something called distributed autonomous organizations, which is a abbreviation, D-A-O, deliberately meant to mimic, uh, even though it really does not relate directly to Taoism but this was uh, uh, something that, that he has a good deal of experience with, and in particular, the serious problems with DAO-type organizations. It certainly matters a great deal. Who is being invited? Who is uh, participating? But we're in um, uh, a period now at which Aaron is deeply engaged, along with others, to try to figure out what the new governance approaches. I hesitate and I will not, in fact, refer to them as models, <laughs> but the approaches to governance under digital conditions must be different. As is clear from uh, our recent election, um, we're, uh, we've lost uh, grip on what's going on here. In fact, many people have come to the conclusion that these um, elections are no longer as meaningful as they might once have been. And, and that, uh, that shift to raising questions about new um, governance models is something that, uh, that Aaron uh, will be contributing to with the rest of our efforts. So we managed to uh, uh, get uh, through the slides uh, in 40 minutes. Thank you very much, uh, Srikant, for your, your help. 
uh, in uh, propelling this forward. Can we go to Q&A now? Yes. Uh, so we have a couple of questions. Uh, the first question is by Joshua. Uh, he asks, there are the mythical works, you know, foundational works of the West, like the Bible or Homer. And there are the foundational works of East, like the Tao or the uh, Confucian Analects. What are the equivalent foundational works for digital sphere? Excellent question. Um, uh, when I first thought about that, I went to my own library, having once been a coder, and uh, you will see in the bibliography, um, pointing to digital sphere, some of the foundational works on operating systems, some of the foundational works on computer architecture. By the way, I was at one point a professional computer architect. Some of the foundational works on programming, some of the foundational works on networking. Um, and uh, uh, this is obviously much newer than those older works. I would like to also add in my response to describe the Bible as mythical <laughs> is probably um, uh, inaccurate. Um, there's an excellent uh, a book recently uh, published by uh, someone who's also done uh, sessions with Shrikant um, on uh, the structure of the Hebrew Bible. Um, and that uh, very nicely describes a paradigm shift. So I, I think it may be fair to think of some of the earlier books in the Hebrew Bible as having a mythical character to them. But by the time we get to writing it down, by the time we get to not just simply reciting the poetry associated with it. Um, I was recently encouraged to try to understand Zoroastrianism. Uh, it might surprise some of you to know that uh, the key books of the Zoroastrian uh, religion were not written down until a long, long time <laughs> after Zoroaster. And it had been uh, repeated uh, orally uh, and indeed, um, uh, it appears that Zoroaster himself effectively sang the uh, original uh, elements of this um, and did not even write them down. So that oral to scribal transition left myth behind. Myth was revived by the electric paradigm. So in the 20th century, mythology became enormously important again as a significant part of that retrieval. Carl Jung is, is, uh, is obviously a key figure, and now we have Jordan Peterson uh, representing that mythological corner of the world. Um, I hope that helps. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Uh, next question. Uh, we've got two more questions. Folks, we'll have time for maybe one or two more questions, so go ahead and type your questions. Next question. Why is it important to criticize um, artificial intelligence or space exploration? Why are those two particularly important in our age? I hope that we're not coming across here as partisans. Um, my criticism of the digital sphere is, uh, if it's critical, it's primarily because it is brand new. Uh, I have a particular uh, relationship with artificial intelligence because my godfather is Norbert Wiener. And so therefore cybernetics and cyborgs and so forth is something that I literally grew up with. But uh, our approach here is not to uh, be partisan. It is, it is not to champion East, West or digital, but rather to try to tease them apart from each other understand those differences, uh, and then try to think through how we might build leadership in a three spheres world. Uh, space travel has um, 
many important issues associated with it. Probably most importantly, as we have discovered with our relatively limited exploration, human beings don't belong in space. I will add, human beings don't belong flying through the air. Human beings also don't really belong 200 feet below the surface of the water, and yet we do it. So we scuba dive, we, uh, we, we skydive, uh, and we're, we're now um, attempting to space dive. But uh, I think my primary point here is linking uh, space and AI is that we're going to have to come up with something which is not human anymore. The digital sphere is pointing towards something that is, to be generous, post-human. I think it's important to use the words that people themselves use to describe their own activities. So I'm just really trying to be digital about this, which is to say, draw distinctions and encourage understanding. Uh, thank you, Mark. Uh, I'm going to put together two of the questions. Um, they say, it looks like the current leadership of China seems to be more Confucian. Why do you say that they have interest in Tao? So what is the role of Confucianism and Taoism in the current Chinese leadership? When I first um, was invited by Phil um, to visit uh, PRC uh, in 1997, as you might imagine, I, I sat down and read 20 books. <laughs> and and what, what jumped out at me particularly when I finally got to Joseph Needham's Science and Civilization in China. So that will also be on the bibliography list. It turns out to be uh, a, a, almost a library unto itself now. Needham brought in many collaborators. Needham was a, a Cambridge University biologist. But what happened when, when Needham studied the question of science and civilization in China is he discovered that most of the science and most of the technology had been developed by Taoists and had been deliberately constrained by Confucians. So one of the um, ways to understand the difference between those two is in relationship to nature, in relationship to stability in human society, in relationship to what we would call experimentation uh, in, in relationship to uh, innovations. Uh, and so through most, but not all of Chinese history, it is correct that Confucianism has probably been the dominant theme. We do not believe that is still the case. Clearly in particular, the books that I read a lot of the history focused on the opium wars. So if you want to understand the current 21st century Chinese mentality, it is important to recognize that these are not people who wipe the slate clean every generation. They remember. And the invasion of, of mainland China, the shelling of, of Canton, ultimately the taking of uh, Shanghai and Hong Kong and Macau uh, by uh, Western uh, forces has left the obvious indelible impression on Chinese civilization. Uh, we will need to develop technology ourselves to allow the West to have preeminence in technology which is probably something that a, a Confucian approach to this topic would have left us with, would mean defeat. And so in order within the, the Chinese configuration uh, to revive uh, a uh, aggressive effort, um, particularly within Chinese civilization, much new technology will need to be brought uh, in and um, indeed uh, controlled. And that is of all of the various schools you might read about uh, in uh, Primer on Chinese philosophy, 
That is the role of Taoism. I will note for you <clears throat> that this initiative to study the classics is personally tied uh, to Xi Jinping, but not him alone by any means. He is surrounded by people who have this basic orientation, this classic orientation, not the least of which is his own wife. Uh, his wife is, uh, I've been told, um, perhaps the most famous uh, folk singer of classical Chinese songs. In addition, his brother-in-law, husband to um, his sister, uh, Xi, Xi Jinping's sister, has probably uh, done the most important revision of Taoism in the, the uh, last hundred plus years. So within the senior Chinese leadership, in addition to the reaching out um, from the top uh, all the way down through the Central Party School to the bottom, this orientation towards remembering the classics uh, in which Taoism and in particular Yi Jing um, which uh, is thought by Chinese to predate all of these systems, uh, gets an enormous emphasis. As I noted earlier, uh, this seems not to have been well recognized yet in the West. One of the projects that I launched a few years ago was to try to get into conversation with the uh, best uh, equipped, most capable Western scholars on the historic relationship between Taoism and technology. Unfortunately, Joseph um, uh, isn't available. Um, uh, and uh, as it turns out, um, the, the leading scholars who happened, uh, not surprisingly, to be British scholars uh, have died and not been replaced. So I am still trying to find someone within Western policy circles um, to expand this conversation. Um, but uh, this shift from a hold back, do not um, upset anything, uh, has been discarded. Um, and indeed, as John just uh, suggested to us, uh, the route to understanding energy probably not um, through uh, general relativity. E equals MC squared is, is not likely to be the answer. Uh, Qigong is likely to be in the uh, efforts to um, understand, harness, and direct Qi uh, seems far more uh, plausible to me than uh, trying to uh, unify um, uh, Einstein and uh, uh, quantum mechanics and string theory. So there are many ways this uh, shows itself, um, but it is uh, uh, very deeply uh, a part of the current situation. Thank you. Uh, the next question is uh, by JJ. The Eastern approach to life is more connectivity and socialism, whereas the Western approach is more individualistic and capitalistic. How does the speaker see the digital sphere shaping our human approach to life? And is there a next stage of human evolution and where is it heading? <clears throat> I was trained as an evolutionary biologist. So I will start by uh, asking the question back, what do you mean by evolution? Um, evolution is a term that winds up being applied to virtually any kind of change, particularly when it is overlaid with a progressive attitude. Uh, that is very much the Western view. Uh, but I think to be fair, uh, things like the singularity, um, things like um, uh, efforts uh, to build uh, general purpose uh, robots, uh, things like space travel are viewed by the digital sphere uh, as they are the most recent expression of that uh, linear progressive 
approach. So if, if you were to ask me, where does the digital sphere fall in relationship to uh, Eastern cyclicality, Western progressivism, um, it has much more of the progress dimension built into it, but it also has some uh, willingness to consider, um, uh, if not entirely remembering classic elements, uh, effectively positing or hypothesizing new potential arrangements. Uh, how that sorts out in terms of human society, we are a long ways yet from knowing. The efforts towards uh, governance structures, uh, such as the DAO, uh, as I mentioned, uh, filling in uh, for Aaron, have um, components of all of this. So I think the most straightforward answer for you with respect to the digital sphere and what it's likely to do to human society is that it is too soon to have definitive answers. But we do know that there is a significant amount of effort, subconscious bias, a great deal of funding going into trying to answer those questions. Um, hopefully uh, at Trivue, we'll be able to explore that in some more detail in our symposium. Okay, I'll ask one last question and then uh, you can make any closing statement that you would want. Uh, last question, you talked about the distinction between the East and the West in great amount of detail. Now, how is the approach of East to digital and West to digital different as a result of their different natures? So you all remember, I would guess, the headlines about uh, Jack Ma and uh, his colleagues, heads of technology companies. And Jack Ma is a particularly important example here because he began to publicly voice in conference speeches and elsewhere, a very digital sphere sort of approach that we are uh, really don't have to uh, uh, hang on to all of this uh, Chinese stuff. We've got a whole new set of answers. Well, you may remember, at least as it was reported here to us, he disappeared for a while. <laughs> he's back and he's singing a very different tune. So the relationship between the East sphere and the digital one is a Taoist relationship as I would describe it. That is to say, nature is the ultimate arbiter what human beings do with technology must fit into that overall framework. And so um, some re-education is called for uh, to bring uh, all of these into a harmonious relationship. Clearly the West sphere, on the other hand, has taken this in a variety of directions. We are going to cut off advanced chips uh, to China. This is straightforward. Um, uh, globalist uh, previous paradigm of uh, efforts. And, and as we have seen with financial um, restrictions and so forth, uh, uh, these are not likely to work in the way that they were intended. But furthermore, uh, the whole question, uh, we would tend to put our relationship to technology companies in an antitrust bucket, or we would expect uh, people at the FTC to somehow deal with this. So the, the West sphere has, in, uh, since it really has no meaningful center, there is no standing committee uh, for the West. The West sphere's approach to this has been um, perhaps a bit disjointed and not particularly effective. The East sphere's approach to date with the digital sphere appears to be one of trying to bring them into the larger uh, effort of civilization, to not leave them alone, 
to not uh, put their faces uh, on the front of Fortune magazine. Fortune magazine recently had the uh, the head of, of uh, FXT, the uh, uh, blockchain company that, that went bankrupt on Friday, um, much as they had uh, the head of uh, Theranos, who is uh, failing apparently in her attempts to convince the judge to like her. Uh, and she's going to be sentenced relatively soon here. So we tend to throw these things into uh, the legal system. And we get the headlines wrong in our magazines. And there's a whole lot of confusion about that. My suspicion is that the East Sphere, uh, in their own mind at least, is harnessing the technology to achieve their ends and does not uh, have the level of uh, evident public confusion that we do about these matters. So there, there are quite different approaches. And, and uh, let me just conclude here. Um, thank you again. In particular, uh, thanks to Srikant. Uh, thanks to fellows at the center. Thanks to our guests of honor uh, who have come to help out here. Uh, this has been uh, a thrill for me to be able to talk to you uh, in this way as an invitation to this uh, new project that we'll be launching next year, Fairview University. Um, we've covered a great deal of material over the course of the last month plus. Um, all of it has been handled obviously in a relatively rapid fire, relatively superficial fashion. If you are interested in how all of these components fit together as your questions uh, would indicate, uh, please send an email uh, to info at trivium.university. That'll wind up in my mailbox. And we'll begin the process of uh, putting together potential uh, candidates for TrivView uh, next year. I very much look forward uh, to expanding on all of these topics. I very much look forward to getting to know many of you as students at TrivView. Again, thank you all very much uh, for your attention uh, and your continued support. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mark. Um, and it is an honor to have you have you back. And hopefully, if we have time, we will do a follow-up Q&A. So keep an eye out uh, for that. Bye, everybody.